Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's Pastor Scott here, and it is uh, Monday afternoon when I'm recording this. You are probably going to be watching this. I'm sorry, it's not Monday afternoon. It's Tuesday afternoon. I don't know why I said that. Um, but it's Tuesday afternoon when I'm recording this, and you'll probably be watching this on Wednesday, uh, maybe Wednesday morning or at some point. Uh, but uh, in, in line with the instructions I was giving you yesterday in the video that I posted, you will watch the video. There will be one question that I'm going to ask you at some point throughout the video that I'm going to want you to answer in the private comment section um, for participation points. And uh, so you want to be paying attention throughout the video to try to make sure that you're uh, absorbing some of the content that I'm covering so that you can then answer the question that I'm going to pose to you. And, uh, and so that being said, we are going to be covering, uh, doing somewhat of a flyover of what Unit 7 would have been all about had we had the time to really cover uh, Unit 7. In the textbook and unit seven is the basis for law the basis for law uh, we were talking about society in unit six and so the next thing after talking about society is talking about law and uh, law and order and uh, all of these kind of things and what is the basis for that and i want to really divide this up into kind of two parts here in understanding uh, what law is and what is the basis and foundation for law the first basis of it is what i would refer to as internal law the second is external law now internal law when i refer to that i'm referring to that sense of law that is built into our mindset, our hearts, our psyche, however you want to refer to it, uh, our minds as humans. Uh, we care about what's right and wrong. We care about what's just. And uh, Paul actually alludes to the law that's really kind of built into our mindset, built into our minds rather, in Romans 2.14. This is kind of the chief text for understanding uh, the basis for uh, internal law, the law on our minds. Romans 2.14, when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. And for context sake, when Paul is saying this, he's writing specifically to, to Jewish people who have the law of Moses as the embodiment of truth and and general um, uh, I guess embodiment's the best way I can put it, for what is right and wrong. They always use the law of Moses, uh, the law that was given to Moses to uh, discern that. Well, Paul is making the point to them that Gentiles, non-Jews, when they care about what's right and wrong, when they're concerned about what's morally upright, ethically true, and whether or not justice is administered, they're proving that there is this, there's a law written on their hearts. They're proving that there is something that is unique about humanity, them included, among all the species uh, of the world. And the thing that's unique is that humanity, unlike any other, any other uh, species, is made in the image of God, made in the image and likeness of God, which means what God cares about, we care about. And what does God care about? Well, we find in Psalm 97.2 that righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Uh, one more just quick little cross-reference here, a couple of Psalms earlier. Psalm 89.14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. So this idea of righteousness and justice, God is a just God. It is innate and inherent to his being God that he is a just and fair and right and, and righteous God. And since you and I are created in his image, we also care deeply about righteousness and about what's just, about what's right. That's why when you see things happening like what's like what has recently happened with this uh uh, the police killing up in Minneapolis, there has just been this this public outrage in all of these different cities uh, and really all over the country because people just care about what's right and wrong. If something is wrong, they want to stand up and call it out. If something is right, they want to see it rewarded. 
uh, so on and so forth. And whether or not you agree with all the motives uh, of, of what seems to be the motivations behind all of these things, whether or not you agree with the protests themselves, uh, I don't because they're not peaceful. Um, regardless of it, it, it illustrates the point that we care deeply about what we perceive to be right and wrong, and that suggests that you and I are subject to a standard that's from the outside of ourselves. It's in us, but we don't know where it came from ourselves. C.S. Lewis talked about how there's this standard of moral rightness that seems to be pressing in on us from the outside, which suggests that it's somebody else who gave it to us. Well, the scripture teaches that somebody else did give it to us, and that's God who made us in his image. Since righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne, Therefore, we care about righteousness and justice immensely as people made in his image. And this is also why Paul preached uh, to the Athenians in Acts 17 that there is coming a day um, when he is going to judge the world in righteousness or in justice by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he's given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. That is to say, there's coming a day when justice is going to win. There's going to be a just judgment. The only way that that can be the case is if God is just and if, as, and if being people made in his image who care about justice, uh, that has to be true as well in order for it to be just for him to judge uh, the world in righteousness. So that's kind of the basis of, of uh, internal law. The fact that we are made in God's image means that we care deeply about what is right and wrong. That's, that's why we care so much about what is right and what is just. So that's internal law. Secondly, we have to understand external law. Since creation exists and therefore there is um, there is a whole a whole world essentially to have to organize and order and structure and manage. Therefore, there is a need to govern it uh, and to govern it well. So Adam was told in Genesis two, a better way to say it than I'm that I'm saying it right now. Uh, in Genesis two, Adam was told to subdue the creation and uh, to be fruitful and to multiply. The idea here is that Adam, you made in my image, are endowed with capabilities and abilities that are different than the rest of the species. You are the one who are who will structure and order and organize all that I have created uh, in a way that ultimately promotes uh, your flourishing and the flourishing of the creation uh, around you. And so this is so it's important to understand that since creation exists and since we're people who live in relationship and community with other people, there are animals, there are societies, there are all kinds of things happening around us. There is a need uh, for there to be a structure to things and for there to be organization. But since humanity is sinful, since we are just by nature, since we have fallen in Adam, it's it's you know sin has touched every part of our being. Therefore, behavior is both good and bad. It's not just good. We do do good things and we do care again about what's right and wrong, but we also do bad things. People do bad things and therefore um, bad behavior needs to be punished and good behavior needs to be rewarded. And this is kind of the basis for external law. This is why laws exist, so that good behavior will be rewarded and bad behavior will be punished, uh, which is um, which is essential to maintain order and peace within a society. And this is why government exists, to, to punish evil and to reward good. And that's getting ahead of myself a little bit because we're going to talk about that in the video that I'm going to post uh, later this week and have for you available on Friday. That's why government exists, is to, is to punish uh, bad behavior and to reward good behavior. From Romans 13, 3 and 4, Rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one in authority? Then do what's good, and you'll receive his approval. For he's God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He's the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. And the interesting thing about that statement there um, in both of those verses is that as Paul is writing this, he's writing this during a time when a pagan 
uh, ruler is in position in the Roman Empire, Emperor Nero, a, a really just a terrible, terrible man. Um, you know, outwardly speaking and inwardly speaking, everybody's a sinner. Uh, but here's a man who just was an awful leader who was terrible to Christians um, and, and really got worse as his reign went along. And yet Paul understands him as a servant of God to some to some degree. I mean, he's not saying that he's a real believer. He's not a Christian by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, Nero was not. Uh, in fact, he hated Christians. Uh, but Paul is teaching that in the sovereignty of God, he's there on purpose uh, to punish bad behavior and to reward good behavior. Now, they can get off, you know, they can get uh, off track on this. Rulers can start to punish bad, uh, good behavior and start to reward bad behavior. Um, but generally speaking, generally speaking, rulers in position tend to reward good behavior and punish uh, bad behavior. And generally speaking, that's the way that, it is, that it's been throughout world history with a lot of caveats because of sinful humanity. But that's what Paul is saying, that that's what the government is there for, is to punish good uh, punish bad and to reward good. Uh, but again, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Um, this, this government of good versus bad, uh, this enforcing of laws has to be according to laws that are just. They have to be just laws that are being pushed and that are being, um, uh, enforced. They have to be just and right laws. And again, like I said earlier, justice in the sense of fairness and rightness is indeed built into our psyche as, as people made in God's image, but it is tarnished because we're a sinful people. Um, and this is why we need the Bible. That's why we, that's why we've got to have the scriptures. That's why, um, you know, that's why Christians uh, do from time to time have to stand up and, you know, stand up for what's right in God's word. Uh, not just from time to time. We always have to be people who do that. I just want to make sure that we remember we're doing this humbly like the Bible tells us to do. Uh, but this is why we pray for leaders who are Christians. Um, this is why churches always have to be making sure that the Bible is being preached and taught so that people know what God's word uh, says. This is why societies need the Bible. We were talking about society being built at really three levels, and uh, one of those levels is the church. The church is essential uh, because the church is supposed to act as the spiritual conscience of the state without being officially yoked with the state. Yet, nevertheless, the church, uh, it, it, you know, it would be ultimately glorifying to God for churches uh, and for the church in a particular you know, state or country or whatever uh, to have such an influence over society, the society is operating according to biblical principles of what's just and what's right because we believe that the God who wrote the scriptures is the God who is just and right. And since we're a sinful people who so easily get off track, which we do, um, we, we need the word of God to be... Um, uh, to be corralling us back in. And we need the word of God to be uh, giving those in positions of authority their standard uh, for what's right and wrong so that they can punish evil truly and reward good uh, truly. Societies need the Bible because although we know what is right and wrong because we're made with that innate to our being, yet we are fallen, like I've said. So we know what's right and wrong, but we're fallen. And because we're fallen, we're biased and we are twisted up in our application of what's right and wrong and in how we think about things. So case in point, you know, like I mentioned, all the events over the last uh, over the last week or so, uh, particularly the president standing up in front of, uh, I think it's St. Paul's Cathedral or something in D.C. holding a Bible. Um, everybody, you know, everybody has a take on that. Everybody has an opinion on that um, right now. And it's no surprise that people are responding to it the way that they have, because you, generally speaking, if people didn't like the president before, they didn't like that he did that. If they did like the president before, they did like that he did that. But people care deeply about it, and they're just so personally and emotionally invested in it because we're made in God's image, and, and he cares about righteousness and justice. You and I... We care about it too. Problem is that we're fallen, so how we apply it is biased. And it's never totally objective. It's never totally fair. So what we need is Jesus and his word. 
Christ is the is the spoken word of God, and the scriptures are the written word of God, and we need that if we would be a lawful people, a people operating according to good laws. Um, so I know this has kind of been a big picture kind of a, a, you know general summary of law, uh, but that's really what these videos are going to be over the last couple of weeks. The question I want I want you to answer for me. And I talked about this pretty explicitly in the first uh, four or five minutes of this video. The question is this, why do we care so much about what is right and just? Why do you and I as humans care so much about what is right and just? Answer that question for me and that'll be worth participation points. And I hope this has been helpful to you. Lord bless you. We'll talk to you soon.